Good morning and, and welcome to the commencement ceremonies for the Goldman School of Public Policy at the University of California, Berkeley. Welcome to Goldman School faculty, students, and staff. And of course, welcome to family, friends, and most of all, welcome to the graduating class of 2017. My name is Henry Brady, and I am lucky enough to be able to serve as the Dean of the Goldman School of Public Policy. Today, we're here to honor celebrate and congratulate the Goldman School's 47th graduating MPP class and our first graduating MPA, Master of Public Affairs class. You know, throughout the year, our faculty and staff and students win lots of awards, but I really want to just uh, stop and talk about two sets of awards. Um, let me mention two staff members who have distinguished themselves this year. These are the staff members who are responsible for our two great master's programs, the Masters of Public Policy and the Masters of Public Affairs. Our senior assistant dean for academic programs and dean of students, Martha Chavez, won two prestigious awards this year. On July 15, 2016, she won the Reverend Clementa C. Pickney Award for outstanding commitment to public service and particularly for her transformational work with respect to the Public Policy and International Affairs Program, which is our program which brings rising juniors to Berkeley for the summer for a seven-week program where they learn about public policy and we hope decide to go into public policy and to enter public policy schools. This is a highly prestigious award, and she was the initial recipient of it. But that's not all, folks. In the spring, she was awarded the 2017 Norden Social Equity Award bestowed by the American Society of Public Administration, which recognizes lifetime achievement and effort in the cause of social equity. Congratulations to Martha. Extraordinary. Our executive director of the Master of Public Affairs, Meg St. John, <laughs> won the sta Chancellor's Outstanding Staff Award for her extraordinary work in bringing our Master of Public Affairs to fruition, a really complicated job given the bureaucracy at Berkeley and all the things that had to be done, and especially since the program, we expected 15 students, we ended up with 25 students. <laughs> but again, that's not all. She was also awarded the Excellence in Management Award, an award for which she was nominated by her staff. So not only did Meg do an extraordinary thing from the perspective of the administration in creating a new program uh, that really required an enormous amount of bureaucratic negotiation, innovation, and inventiveness, she also, in the process, made her staff feel like she was an extraordinary manager. Nothing could be better. Congratulations to Meg St. John. And Meg, where's Meg? Is Meg out there someplace? Martha, by the way, is right there. <laughs> and Meg, I hope, is somewhere out there. There's Meg, way in the back. OK. These two people are the people who make our programs the great programs they are. On a day-to-day -day basis, they make sure that things work and that we continue to have the best public policy program in the nation. Indeed, the Goldman School of Public Policy, founded in 1969, was one of the nation's first graduate programs of its kind. Today, the Goldman School is ranked as the number one graduate school in public policy analysis. It's hard not to be incredibly proud of that record of accomplishment. At, at the same time, I'm feeling a little old-fashioned these days. Uh, I'm sure the students will tell you that's absolutely true. Um, that feels comfortable in some ways. 
and in other ways it makes me worry. The comfortable part has to do with my belief in public policy. I continue to believe that data and information matter in public policy. I continue to believe that we'll do better if we have knowledge and forethought in public policy. As the students know, I sent out an email when the 24 million number came out from the Congressional Budget Office. You remember in the midst of the first round of considering the President's new health care uh, proposal that there was a, a Congressional Budget uh, Office report that said that 24 million people would lose their health care coverage between 2016 and 2026 if that were implemented. That number was cited again and again in editorials. It became a pivotal issue with respect to that new program. And in the end, I think it had an impact on the first round, there being no way to go forward. And then, of course, it, it did lead ultimately to a second round in which the House has approved uh, a bill. But I think that number is still in circulation. It's still an important consideration with respect to the future of the health care program that the Republican Party is, is pushing through Congress right now. So numbers matter. And by the way, that number came out of the Congressional Budget Office from an office that had several people that were graduates of the Goldman School of Public Policy. I'm even heartened by the fact that former Senator from South Carolina, Jim DeMint, has been pushed out of his job as head of the Conservative Heritage Foundation because the Conservative Heritage Foundation thought that the foundation that is sometimes thought of as the public policy arm of the conservative movement should have done a better job of coming up with a health care program and that they had failed to do so, and that Jim DeMint had become nothing more than a spokesperson for the Republican Party. So even the Heritage Foundation felt that good public policy mattered. And I am heartened by the fact that President Trump indicated in February that health care policy is an unbelievably complex subject, in his words. But I'm a little distressed by the way he went on to say Nobody knew health care could be so complicated. That's a bit worrisome. Actually, just about everybody knows that health care is complicated. So that's what worries me. And I'm distressed that many topics seem to yield these days to seemingly popular solutions that, upon reflection and analysis, don't really work. So I'm happy that public policy teaches us about the complexity of health care where, by the way, demand curves actually don't slope down as they're supposed to. They slope upwards, which means basically that the people who provide the supply can create their demand, and that's one of the problems with health care. And we teach that at the Goldman School, and I'm sure you've all heard about demand curves that slope upwards in your classes. Um, I'm happy that public policy gives us the tools to make projections about the impacts of policies, such as health care. But I'm discouraged that this knowledge seems to be a revelation to some people. And I'm especially worried about how we get the message out about considering our public policies more carefully. How do we improve advocacy for excellent public policy? Clearly, we have to find ways to do that. Luckily, when I look at the class before me, I'm heartened by the fact that they are asking just that question. And I thank you for asking it. And they're pushing the faculty and me to think about that question. I don't think we have the answers yet, but we're trying to figure out a way to retain our traditional value, which is, I think, analysis. Retain my hat as well, uh, which turns out to be more difficult than I thought it would be. Um, <laughs> but to retain our commitment to public policy analysis, but at the same time to do a better job of getting it out into the world and making sure that good analysis actually matters. I'm really heartened to look at this group before me, because this is a group of students devoted to getting the right answers, to thinking hard about problems, and to making the world better. I hope that doesn't make you feel old-fashioned. You're not old-fashioned. We need that kind of expertise in the public sector. I hope it makes you feel empowered and capable. So it must be frustrating to see all the nonsense that is out and about these days. Uh, but you've got the skills and knowledge that will enable you to take problems and figure out how to solve them. We hope you will experience the same sense of accomplishment as many graduates 
who have come before you. I speak on behalf of the faculty and staff here at the Goldman School. We've all witnessed your many accomplishments. We're proud about what you've done at your time during here at GSPP. We're proud of each and every one of you. Through your IPAs, your internships, your APAs and capstones, you have already contributed in many, many ways to thinking hard about public policy problems, trying to make the world a better place, trying to make it a more fair place, a more effective place. And you've done that here in the Bay Area, in the nation, and around the world. So one of the most exciting things about being the dean of the Goldman School is learning about all the extraordinary things that you do as students, but also what you're going to do as alumni. Last week I was in Washington, D.C., meeting with our alums in Washington, D.C., and it was extraordinarily wonderful to be talking to them, to find out all the amazing things they were doing at the Congressional Budget Office and the federal agencies and so forth, and they were definitely making a difference. So I'm going to have the joy of witnessing all the things that you're going to accomplish. And more than ever, nothing could be more important than to have dedicated, commit, committed, thoughtful, and immensely talented individuals out there in the world trying to do good public policy analysis and trying to make the world a better place. I feel blessed to be at GSPP, which is trying to do that. I think it's a noble mission. I think it's an extraordinary thing that we can contribute to the world to actually stop and think and make the world better. And I'm awestruck at your abilities, at your accomplishments so far, and I'm excited about what you're going to do into the future. So thank you. This event has a special significance for everyone here today. And I want to stop and just thank all the families, spouses, partners, children, and friends who have supported our graduates during their time at GSPP. So let's have a round of applause for the families, friends, spouses, children, everybody who supported you. So now you're just about to join our alumni, all of whom have a common bond, the Goldman School, extraordinary networks of people, and they all have a desire to make the world a better place. We look forward to the exciting work that lies ahead. And now I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Ginny Fang is an MPP alumna from the class of 2008 and in her third year as a member of the GSPP Alumni Association Board of Directors. She's the chief, chief, global, uh, chief executive officer of Golden Gate Global, located in the city of San Francisco. Golden Gate Global is licensed by the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services to help facilitate EB-5 immigrant investment into high economic impact projects in the San Francisco Bay Area. Please welcome Ginny Fang. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Brady. Uh, you guys get to do this every year, but there's, a, there's magic in that music, I have to say. Uh, good morning, GSPP. It's wonderful to be here. My name is Ginny Fang. Uh, I graduated from the Goldman School of Public Policy uh, with an MPP about nine years ago. We look forward to a 10-year reunion soon uh, as part of the class of 2008. Uh, I'm currently a member of the GSPP Alumni Association Board of Directors. We're comprised of 15 uh, GSPP alums, and we work hard to support the school by engaging uh, in projects and initiatives that benefit both uh, students and, uh, and alumni. So I am thrilled and honored to be here today uh, to congratulate you on completing your master's degree. Uh, and on behalf of the Goldman School alumni community, I officially, I, I guess I'm the first to officially welcome you uh, into the Goldman School of Public Policy Alumni Association. So I have two very important messages to convey today. First, uh, today you join over 2,000 GSPP uh, alumni who are spread out around the world making a better place uh, in this world. And no matter your vision of how you intend to strike out on your path, 
Uh, this global network of GSPP alumni can really help connect you, can better connect you to important people, important ideas, and important work that is already underway. Uh, don't hesitate in your path as you move forward uh, to reach out and tap into that incredible resource uh, because it is that, that network of people that will connect you and put you in a better place to better effectuate your ideas, uh, your will, and your vision of the future. Uh, never underestimate the power of that network. Uh, as, a, as a nod to uh, maybe the Golden State Warriors win yesterday, there's strength in numbers. <laughs> yes, go, go Warriors. Um, second, uh, as the newest members of our GSPP community, we really ask you to be an active part of that community and that global network. You also bring your ideas, your resources, your relationships, and as you mature in your career and as you go forth into the world, those resources will multiply exponentially. And so it's important that you also actively engage and be part of that network and part of that global community. Uh, GSPP alumni continue to support the school decades beyond their graduation day uh, by volunteering with prospective students. I'm sure you uh, remember may maybe having your initial interviews. Um, they participate in important school initiatives. They provide those internships, IPAs, APAs, and you all just benefited from, from that uh, outreach as well. And of course, this is my plug, uh, giving back financially to the school and you all have done so generously with your first class gifts back to the school. So we take pride in our incredible alumni network around the world. They are some of the most actively engaged global citizens uh, in this world. And we look forward to seeing how you uh, engage and contribute in your careers, uh, engage and contribute into the GSPP network, and then engage and contribute into the world at large in the years to come. So again, on behalf of the Goldman School of Public Policy Alumni Association Board of Directors, uh, we congratulate the class of 2017. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. This time I did not wear my hat. It just wasn't working. <laughs> uh, I think it's a little too big. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce to you our keynote speaker for the class of 2017 commencement exercises, Senator Robert Hertzberg. In 2014, Bob Hertzberg became the first former assembly speaker in 86 years to be elected to the California State Senate, the upper house, and one of only six lawmakers in California history to serve as assembly speaker and subsequently win a seat in the Senate. He represents nearly one million residents in the LA area. A lawyer for 37 years, Hertzberg was Speaker of the California State Assembly from 2000 to 2002 and served on the UC Board of Regents. He was instrumental in getting the 10th UC campus started in Merced and dramatically expanding the Cal Grant Scholarship Program, which is an incredibly important thing for the University of California. It's really the thing that allows us to provide access to large numbers of students and to, to undertake one of the most important missions we have, which is not only to be excellent as a university, but also to provide access to low-income students. So I really thank you for that. He has extensive experience as a world traveler, clean energy entrepreneur, one of the companies he co-founded won the Wall Street Journal Award for Innovation in 2005, and another won the World Bank Award for Lighting Africa for a project in Rwanda. In 2000K, the UK's Guardian magazine named Hertzberg as one of the 50 people who could save the planet. The Los Angeles Times said this about Bob Hertzberg, and I love this, he is a high velocity wonk we love wonks at the Goldman School. He loves big ideas and will flesh out every one of them if you give him a chance. The Daily News has said, Hertzberg has a relentless dedication and indefatigable energy. He has a reputation for integrity and perseverance. Really lovely qualities. Really important qualities, I think, in fact, to be a politician these days, to have both integrity and perseverance, that's wonderful. He is one of the founders of the Think Long Committee of California, which helped develop important reforms on legislative term limits, 
a majority vote state budget, citizen-based redistricting, and the initiative process. By the way, these reforms have really made California much more governable. And they were very innovative and clever and important. And we really have our next speaker, our commencement speaker, Senator Robert Hertzberg, to thank for these reforms. Senator Hertzberg. <laughs> I'm not saying anything after that. Thanks, Dean, I really appreciate it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for your kind words. Thank you to the professors and administrators who are here. Such faces, it's very nice. Thank you guys, really appreciate it. And most importantly, thank you, as you suggested earlier, for leading the number one public policy graduate program in the United States of America. Let's give it up. Pretty cool. Now, before I begin, I will ask all the graduates and their families and friends to please rise. Everyone, please rise. That's right, all you guys, too. It's right. I like this. Now reach out to the right, grab the person next to him, give him a big hug. This is a great day to celebrate. You're graduating. Come on, group hug. Come on, light it up. Hold on, I'm taking a picture here. All right, you can sit down now. It's an important day, man. Let's break the ice. This is Berkeley, guys. Come on. And I just want to say before I begin with my wonky words, to give a shout out to your incredible new chancellor, Dr. Carol Chris. Many of you won't get to benefit from her leadership, but all I want to say, ladies and gentlemen, she is a rock star, man. She's the greatest. Pretty good, huh? Yeah. <laughs> As each of you know, we are living in an age of unprecedented change. And the issues that each of you will face as you choose your path in the public policy world will be profoundly different from graduates just a few years ago. You can ask Ginny, who just spoke to you. I am certain, I am certain, that no Goldman graduate in the class of 2005 or even in the class of 2010 ever thought of writing on the opportunities to enhance cybersecurity in the Bay Area as Ray, Ryan Melendez has done. Where's his good work? Where's Ryan, baby? There he is. And I am certain that no former graduate would have imagined the need to study the impact of digital surveillance on California's K through 12 schools as the subject of a master thesis as Sahabnaz Rashid Dia did in her, and she just completed. Where's Sahabnaz? Where are you? I don't see her. The world is changing and they're changing fast, and each of you are exploring it in ways never before imagined. We are facing a profoundly different world with new challenges that will result in your entry in the public policy world in manners very different from previous graduates. And you will forward a yet unimagined path. And it is particularly important that as you enter this new field of, as public policy professionals, you, you provide perhaps our greatest hope to emerge from a period dominated by partisanship and extremism to a period of thoughtful, fact-based reason, public policy, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> just think, just think, if you started here at Berkeley as a freshman, on the day you started, Snapchat was not yet founded, as it, and it nearly has 200 million daily users. If you started here as a freshman in 2011, you would not know Lyft because it was not founded until July 2012. Today it earns a billion dollars a year and changes the way you think about going to a party. <laughs> True? <laughs> Maybe Uber, but 
driverless cars were only a concept, and now they're operating on our roads. I just took a drive in one at Google a few weeks ago, and frankly, it was pretty incredible. Now, as each of you face the public policy world, you will be redesigning cities, converting parking lots to housing and vertical farms to reduce food miles and bring better quality food to the inner cities like Hortensia Rodriguez Sandoval is thinking about on her thesis for Latino farm ownership in California. Where's Hortensia? I saw earlier. All right. The rate of change is accelerating, not just in technology and the questions it poses, but socially too. Consider this. In April 2011, at the annual White House Correspondents' Dinner, Donald Trump was ridiculed and laughed at, viewed as substanceless political lightweight because of his nonstop questioning of President Obama's place of birth. Now, well, you know. <laughs> Your challenges are nothing less than extraordinary. And I come here today with one simple message. You don't have time to waste to change the world. The world needs you right now. There's a great story, my dad used to tell me, of when the former Frank, uh, President Franklin Roosevelt went to visit Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes in the hospital. As he wheeled himself into the hospital room, he noticed that the Supreme Court Justice was reading a book on Greek grammar. He told the Justice, you're 92 years old. What the heck are you doing reading Greek grammar? Justice Holmes quietly responded, I'm improving my mind. As brilliant as each of you are to be graduates of this number one public university, you need to continue to be creative, and more than ever, you need to, to be constantly improving your mind. This age demands it. And I would suggest that regarding your public policy career paths, that such opportunity for improvement will find its place in what historically have been non-traditional jobs. In the 21st century, public policy and considerations about the public good and what it means is interwoven into society and, and the economy like never before. Uber and Lyft need Andrew Herman's thinking on entrepreneurial activity as they assess their driverless car impacts on our community. Parking lot companies will need Hortensia's ideas on converting their properties to farms to serve certain largely Latino urban communities. Fundamental questions about how we live, who is affected, must be addressed at many levels. Are we retreating from the commons? Are water bottles sold in every store a good development? I say you must consider and should address the consequences. It monetizes water, good quality water, and allows society to, run, to turn a blind eye to those with no access to good quality drinking water or money to buy it. We all breathe the same air, we all drive on the same roads, but do we all have the same smartphones or access to the same quality of food? The common good, the common good is what public policy is all about. In my mind, public policy can never retreat from the commons. As we deal with the challenging issues regarding the future of work, there are companies who are training FedEx drivers and fast food workers in Baltimore to become highly trained code writers, women, African American, blue collar workers who would never fit into the culture and biases of Silicon Valley, but who are outperforming their counterparts in California and beyond. All of these companies will need thinkers who can help design worker retraining programs to supplement what government has been doing. Julian Rue, we need your thinking on labor markets and not just in New Zealand to help us with these challenges. In our modern era, consumers are accustomed to instantaneous service, something government is notoriously slow at responding to. Right? We need your, your brains to assist co-writers to create government apps that help people at all levels of government, particularly the underserved. A number of years ago, our California government created what we labeled CalWORKs, then new Clinton reforms on, wel uh, on welfare. But when the program was implemented, it took 67 pages for an applicant to enroll. enroll. Out of California's nearly 40 million people, less than 150 Californians enrolled until we got it right, reducing the relationship between the program and people down to a postcard. 
Plain and simple, government is not user-friendly, and your minds are urgently needed to bring new and fresh thinking on how to make government a friendlier user experience and more productive. We just passed a law, a new law in California last year that I jointly authored to create vote centers and shopping centers and schools that are open for 10 days prior to voting to deal with participation and voting disparities. But it's barely enough. Christian Arana, we need your help to help booster vote participation and the work that you did. I am deeply concerned about the future of our democratic institutions. I think the message of the last elections has to do with exploitation of fear, fear caused by the rate of change in our society. We need to reinvent ourselves and to reinvent ourselves quickly. That's why I stress no time to waste. Please experiment, try new paths. In Silicon Valley, they say that all the buildings are only two stories. When startups fail, the founders jump out the window and only sprain an ankle. Many in Silicon Valley have sprained a lot of ankles, especially those who have gone on to success. And you Goldman graduates need to sprain a few ankles in the process of moving public policy forward fast, intelligently, and creatively. And don't worry, it doesn't hurt that much. <laughs> I've done it a few times. You live in a new world with new tools. What is clear to me is that public policy is the action arm of academia. You are trained to think to question, to create, regarding the social and policy challenges we face. But what is different now is that there are so many ways to make the needed change and to improve the common good. Just not just getting a teaching job or a government job. No disrespect to you cats. <laughs> Johnson's a funny guy. He blew it at breakfast this morning. Now I got to go out with him again. Jesus. But don't discount the importance of elected office. While fundraising and campaign can certainly be horrible, and I can attest to that very clearly, but the importance of your skills in city halls and legislators as elected official has never been more crucial. The world needs your mind, it needs your passion for, and your understanding of the common good that you learned here at the Goldman School. As I conclude, I want to remind you of the extraordinary morality and purpose of Richard Goldman, for whom this magnificent school of public policy was named, and his wife. On Friday, I happened to have lunch with a very important rabbi in Los Angeles, just by happenstance, and told him I would be here. He was a close friend of Richard Goldman, and he told me stories about this man's character and who he was. And of course, of course obviously, by having his name and his wife's name on the building, uh, he was a man of extraordinary generosity but he sold insurance and he understood the social purpose of insurance and dealt with his company in a very different way. And he was not only philanthropic at the institutional level, but quietly and anonymously helped hundreds of families. He told me, the rabbi, that Maimonides taught us that the highest form of philanthropy was to help people consistently and anonymously. That's what Mr. Goldman did. And as you solve the problems of the world and make our communities better, never forget, never forget to always pay it forward and help others who are less fortunate. Don't forget or retreat from the commons. Congratulations, you guys. Go to work. Lock and load. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My thanks to Senator Hertzberg. He has to leave to go do the state's business. So we're going to let you go down the stairs. Hey, Be guys, careful. Anybody working on bail reform or, or excessive fines? I got a hearing and appropriations. And I, go <laughs> I need some help. <laughs> Any, anybody who wants to go and help, please feel free. But, but maybe you should stay here and get your diploma. So now we have the student speakers. Please come up. Ballora Deethy. now. Um, 
Good morning, everyone. I can't promise to be nearly as dynamic as Senator Hertzberg. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Aditi, and I'm here to speak on behalf of the graduating class of MPP students. So first off, uh, as he makes his exit, I'd like to thank Senator Hertzberg for his remarks. I'd also like to extend my gratitude on behalf of the GSPP class of 2017 to the people who have made our accomplishments possible, our distinguished faculty, our tireless staff and administration who keep GSPP running behind the scenes, and I think Martha especially deserves a shout out here. <laughs> and our loved ones, of course, uh, who've endured everything from physical distance to long, passionate rants about frustrating problem sets <laughs> to support us as we pursued our educations. We wouldn't be here today without your sacrifices, your encouragement, and your boundless faith in us. Please join me in a round of applause for these folks. Now, when I was thinking about what insights I could possibly share with such an incredible group of scholars and friends, seriously, I'm in so in awe of your intelligence, your compassion, your humor, your dogged commitment to progressive social change. I kept circling back to GSPP's motto, speak truth to power. So I'm going to offer my reflections on what I think it will take to live out that promise to speak truth to power as we strive to leave the world a better place than what we found it. First, we must recognize that a claim to expertise is a claim to power. However small we may feel in the shadow of policy problems ranging from climate change to child poverty, we actually wield powerful tools to shape the world around us. And with our degrees in hand, we have the legitimacy as newly minted policy analysts, advocates, organizers, to seriously influence the lives of the people we hope to serve. The thing is, the exercise of that power is never as comprehensive or as objective as we like to imagine. As anthropologist Tanya Lee describes in her work, The Will to Improve, experts are trained to draw boxes around human problems and transform them into relatively straightforward technical problems. So often, we lose the context of history and politics when we define problems in the neatly prescribed terms of present-day market failure, reinforcing status quos and neglecting the ways in which past policies have served to shape present realities. For example, if segregation is a problem of insufficient access to capital and robust financial institutions, then it's not a problem of the local, state, and federal policies that enforce the separation of communities of color from white ones. And the solutions that follow from this limited problem framing, they won't touch the factors that gave life to the problem in the first place. We have the power to shape the narratives of cause and effect, of problem and solution. But our good intentions are not a substitute for the meaningful integration of ethics into policy analysis. And our technocratic methods aren't devoid of value judgments. We have the power to harm as well as heal, and we must be careful in how we exercise it. Second, we must reckon with the limits of our expertise. For some of us, that may be easy. I, for one, find it boggling that after today, I'll be the master of anything, <laughs> considering the fact that I still call my parents for help on my taxes, <laughs> and the only way I can catch the bus in the morning is by making a run for it with my coat half on, half off, and a piece of toast dangling out of my mouth. It doesn't work so well. But in all seriousness, even armed with the specialized knowledge we have about Oaxaca blinder decompositions and the Eightfold Path, it seems absurd that we have the authority to offer meaningful recommendations for mitigating food insecurity or reducing employment barriers to the formerly incarcerated, given that few of us may actually have faced anything like these problems. We can certainly work through the theory. Where has the market failed and why? What incentives will move people to the consumption patterns we think are best for society? But our expertise isn't infallible or exhaustive, and our work rings hollow if we don't incorporate considerations of the actual lived experiences of the people who face these problems. Finally, and this is shamelessly ripped off from legal scholar and activist Brian Stevenson, proximity matters to good policymaking. We have to get up close and personal with the people and the problems they experience and use our power strategically to lend the voiceless a platform to speak their truths. How do they perceive the problems they face? What trade-offs do they consider when they make hard choices about resource allocation in the face of scarcity? What matters most to them? 
Our expertise is important, but removed from the constituencies we hope to serve, it is all too easy to reproduce the same structural inequities in these communities that we hope to overcome. Proximity changes us. It allows us to rediscover the human face to the technical problems we hope to solve and tempers our expertise with the humility that service to a community requires. We're graduating at a time that is sure to be rife with challenges, and the past two years have been a humbling reminder of the scale and complexity of the problems we hope to confront. Internationally, we've seen the desperation of refugees and migrants to find homes where they can live free of the threat of violence, in a forceful reminder of the instability colonialist resource mongering has inflicted on the Middle East and North Africa. At home, we've borne witness to a new wave of white nationalism in our policymaking and our public life, proving yet again what people of color have always told us, that racism is alive and well in the United States. <laughs> Poverty and economic inequality continue to be pressing issues that underwrite almost every policy area in which we work. And in the face of these problems, the question I keep asking myself is, who are we to solve them? Well, we're future civil servants and policy wonks. We're organizers for change and data analysts who probably will never see the light of day again. <laughs> and if we acknowledge the tremendous power that our expertise lends us, for good or ill, if we recognize the limits of our expertise and supplement it with the knowledge of the people we hope to serve, if we get proximate enough to use our platform as policymakers to let marginalized spe people speak for themselves, we'll surely fulfill the promise we've made as members of the Goldman community. Congratulations, class of 2017. Go forth and speak your truth to power. Now I'd like to call Julian Rue up to the, pro, uh, to the podium. Um, he's been selected by his MPA classmates to address the MPA class of 2017. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, good luck. Thank you, Dithi. Oh, that is a tough act to follow up. Whew. So my name is Julian Rue. I am a first and a last year MPA. <laughs> and it is a great honor and privilege to represent the very first Master of Public Affairs class at the Goldman School of Public Policy. <laughs> and it's a great honor, and it's a great honor to share this time with our very distinguished MPP class. Thank you for welcoming us to the community. <laughs> But before, um, just to lighten it up, before we get started, I did, uh, I did want to make one, one observation. I think because of the addition of the MPA class, this is the biggest graduation in the history of GSPP. Yes, very big. I mean, very big, very big. Really, really big. Really big, tremendously big league, very big league. Oh, man. What a, what a year it's been, huh? Uh, it was about a year ago that my MPA colleagues and I arrived on campus. And so much we've learned from our renowned faculty. Uh, I couldn't even hope to summarize it right now. Um, but I don't know about my MPA classmates, uh, but I think I've really internalized all the wisdom that we've received. So yes, there's the Eightfold Path. There's Dan Acklandisms, and there's uh, there's Ikiru moments, but I think, it's, I think it's really actually affected the way I talk now. Um, like when, when I hear people speak, I just feel this temptation to, to say, loudly, clearly, and slowly. <laughs> and then when people, when people are asking me for advice, uh, I find myself saying, you know, well, that, that depends. 
Maybe. Maybe not. You tell me. And then, and then, of course, you know, when I'm talking to audiences like this, I mean, I'm always tempted to say, can you see? <laughs> you all with me? All right, good, good, good. So, well, let's talk about, let's talk about the MPAs. I'm sure the MPPs have been asking, who are these random older people walking around campus <laughs> reminiscing about Bill Clinton and <laughs> landline phones? Yes, we're, we're civil servants, we're community organizers, we're nonprofit leaders, philanthropy experts, we're actresses, attorneys, activists, and architects. That's who we are, but I want to focus on why we are here. Remember, we are mid-career. We were already established in our careers. We were successful, and we were on a continued path to success. So why pursue an MPA? It's not for the money, <laughs> unless you enjoy spending it. Uh, it's not for the credential. We took a risk coming to a first-year program. No, I would contend that the motivation was that we all wanted to make more of a social impact. Even with, even with stability and success, we wanted to do more. We wanted to learn more. We wanted to work harder. Because we wanted to make that incremental impact, and whether that meant changing a career, learning a new sector, or making our existing organizations work better, we knew that this is the definition of a public servant. Someone with relentless drive, no matter where they are in their career, to make public institutions run better, to make our earth more sustainable, and most importantly, to bring dig dignity and agency to people who need it most. And it's been alluded to uh, with our past distinguished speakers here, but public institutions are under attack. And I believe that relentless public servants like us are going to be needed more than ever. And for GSPP, whose mission is to create leaders for the common good, like the senator talked about, and to, to learn the know-how to apply that to the real world, I think relentless public servants in their mid-career is a critical element of that mission. We as MPAs, we could have gone to another mid-career program that was already established. I heard there's a couple private schools out east that have them but we decided to come to the top public policy analysis school at the world's premier and most distinguished public university. Because we knew, we knew this is where our values and our goals would intersect. And what have we found? Well, I believe we have found, we have found an institution that is preeminent without being elite. We have cohorts, we have a cohort that is ambitious yet considerate. We have a community that is truly inclusive. And we have an academic environment that takes our work seriously, but doesn't take ourselves too seriously. So on behalf of the very first Master of Public Affairs cohort, I want to say that's been a blast and it's been an honor. And to the whole GSPP community, I want to send our gratitude. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now it is my distinguished pleasure to introduce our renowned faculty speaker, Professor Rucker Johnson, who was selected by our graduating class. Thank you. Good morning, class of 2017. You know, it's, uh, there's not much to say, actually. 
after you have these inspiring and dynamic student speakers before you. But I still will offer mine. <laughs> Dean Brady, most distinguished honorees, dedicated family, friends, faculty, and especially to each of the talented, ambitious, courageous, passionate, civic-minded GSPP graduates of the class of 2017 before us here today, thank you. I, I, I run out of adjectives to describe your tremendous exploits, and particularly the ones we anticipate you will do from this point onward. What an honor it is to share in this day with you, and especially to a privilege it has been to teach in the core graduate MPP and PhD programs and our, our inaugural MPA cohort. You soon to be alumni of the 47th graduating class of Goldman have made an indelible mark on the school, and I think the school's made an incredible impact on you, your worldviews, igniting your engagement in public policy issues. Now we know there's no testimony without a test. And we attest as faculty that this 2017 graduating class of GSPP has passed with flying colors. Well, some less vibrant colors than others, <laughs> but in full color, all the same. All manner of examination, cross-examination, from 48-hour projects to econometrics finals to APAs. But how many of you know these milestones are never accomplished alone? So while we've done it already, let's give an, another round of applause to the best supporting actors and actresses in our lives that are our help the parents, the spouses, the siblings, the family, the friends. This is our Oscars, and we stand on the shoulders of giants. So let's give another round of applause. Amen. Now, I was invited as a faculty speaker, but I'm actually here as a weatherman, your personal meteorologist today. And what's your favorite season? You got fall, spring, summer, winter. Well, mine is commencement season. <laughs> and whether you're a graduate or not, it's a time to reflect, listen to others' lessons, life lessons, celebrate the accomplishments, and look to the future with hope. And as your economic meteorologist, <laughs> making forecasts is what we do. And based on all the models my research team has done, I declare, the forecast is tremendously bright. <laughs> Even amid some divisive overcast storm clouds developing at the federal level. <laughs> but we understand elections determine who gets the power, not who offers the truth. So let the light inside you shine brighter than the light that's on you. As Dr. Martin Luther King once said, only in the darkness can you see the stars. And we're here today to celebrate our stars, the glory of your future is so bright. <laughs> you are morning sun. You are morning sun rising above yesterday's limitations, rising with warmth of purpose. And as you move into that purpose, remember that daily, we make choices, and our choices make history. And you're here because you consistently choose to be upstanders, not bystanders. You choose to leave with the valued principles of inclusivity, diversity, justice. You've chosen a career path where you shine your light in service of others. You choose not to simply respond to the priorities and politics of a moment, but to invest yourselves in the important issues for humanity and the world we live in. Our lives don't revolve around election cycles but rather around the gravitational pull of purpose. You embody that unmistakable sense of agency, a desire to do the most good for the greatest amount of people. And it's in this way, collaboratively, collectively, that this graduating class has earned the highest grade on the test that really matters. Your time here will prove to be an important springboard catapulting you into another level of that purpose. Now, UC Berkeley is not just a world-class university with the top public policy school in the country, but it's a sanctuary institution. Withstanding the chains, changing winds of time, where we exchange light with each other 
and watch the donning of our future leaders in public service. For public servants are ordinary people doing extraordinary jobs, lifting up undeserved, underserved populations, left out voices, excluded groups, to make room at the table upon which policy analysis and policy formation occurs in city halls, state capitals, legislative halls. We have an unwavering commitment to social justice, equal opportunity, production of rigorous research to inform contentious debates. We answered the call to seek solutions to the problems of our generation and anticipate those of future ones. The first step is to see the problems. The first problem is the failure to see the people. So I want you to not lose sight that underneath all the statistics and rigorous analyses lie children, families, communities personally affected. And what we're asking of you is to transition from studying how to measure causal effects to cause and effect. We expect you to be the producers of global effects. And we stand on the front lines of climate change, energy and environmental policy, to education policy, economic policy, international economic development, criminal justice policy, national security, and so much more. And speaking of so much more, have you ever heard the sentence, it's just a piece of paper? Someone could look at your birth certificate and say, it's just a piece of paper. Some may not value the purpose of marriage and say, it's just a piece of paper. Some see this day you culminate your educational endeavors and say, it's just a piece of paper. <laughs> but no one sees this and says it's just a piece of paper. <laughs> so let's not be foolish knowing the price of everything but the value of nothing. Today is much more than receiving another piece of paper. Today you get a passport, one without parameters as you journey the paper trail between your birth certificate and death certificate. <laughs> this passport is not an ending, but a beginning of new possibilities, new opportunities. Your passport gives you access to places you may not even know exist. Today's piece of paper is a passport to get past the border patrol of hesitation Get past the border patrol of self-imposed limitations. Get past the border patrol of external expectations. You are now free to move about the country and beyond. Leave behind a trail of ideas and good works across the globe that others may follow your footsteps. Remember, ideas travel. It's a new global world. But let's consider the paper trail of our distinguished alumni for glimpses of where your passport may take you. Our footprint is global. Holly Harvey, who sat in your seat 30 years ago. This GSPP alum is currently Deputy Assistant De Director of the U.S. Congressional Budget Office. Nani Coloretti, most recently Deputy Secretary of the U.S. Department of House Housing and Urban Development, was just named Urban Institute Senior VP. Pamela Spratlin, U.S. Ambassador to the State Department under President Obama. Andreas Romer, Mexican diplomat and one of Mexico's most internationally recognized public intellectuals. Michael Cabori, currently Vice President of Sustainability at Levi Strauss. Gary Pruitt, President and CEO of the Associated Press. I could go on and on, but leadership is not a position or title. It's an action and an example. And while your path may be different, a fantastic odyssey awaits you as you move ahead to discover what lies in the center of the intersection of four keys, your passion, your mission, your vocation, and your profession. It's the nexus and the interconnected embodiment of what you love, what you're great at, what the world really needs, and you get paid for it. <laughs> it's a place I call purpose. Now, Mark Twain once said the two most important days in your life are the days you were born and the day you find out why. People get burned out on their jobs not because of what they do, but because they forgot and they forget why they do it. Know your why, don't forget your purpose. Now, I recall on my graduation day when I was awarded my PhD, which is now many years ago, I expected to suddenly feel smarter, like the scarecrow in Wizard of Oz, like wish for brains. <laughs> Spoiler alert. <laughs> not gonna happen instantaneously. 
And that kind of idea that I finally arrived, I, I, that elusive, again, even metaphorically, no such destination exists. But the solid foundation you've gained at GSVP allows the weight of everything else that you'll do to be well supported. And you've been set apart. This graduating class at GSVP is a diverse collection of change agents. There's two types of people. There are thermometers and there's thermostats. Now you can allow your circumstances to change you or instead you can be the person that changes the outcome. So be the thermostat that sets the conditions that change the environment around you. Now, history has shown that people have rarely met innovation and change with confidence and enthusiasm. Consider the reaction to the pencil, which scholars like Plato thought would have a negative impact on our memory. But to change the course of history, waters flow in one direction, and a single pebble strategically placed can change the entire currents of rushing water. Many of you have that opportunity to be that single pebble, but it often requires taking the road less traveled to relinquish our fears and consider the magic that could happen if we take that step. You are creating an original. Don't die a copy. Take a risk. Give the world your unique individuality and catalytic creative capacities for innovation. And in closing, let's just take a lesson from what the automobile industry can teach us about innovation and policy analysis. In the early 1900s, Henry Ford changed the world with the creation of the assembly line production system, creating vehicles at a rate and efficiency level never before seen. Adopted by manufacturers around the world, the assembly line remained the dominant global production strategy for nearly a century. As Ford said, if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said, faster horses. Instead, it was the mass production of the horseless carriage, the car. Now, although assembly line prototype was extremely efficient, there were known limitations. The system was unable to, defect, to, to detect defects and wasted resources. Toyota profoundly advanced the auto industry with a new manufacturing model known as lean manufacturing, which greatly improved quality control and resource allocation. By the turn of the 20th century, lean manufacturing had gained widespread popularity. No longer did one person contribute one auto part in a silo. Now, there were several people synergistically collaborating as a team to produce the whole car. Workplace productivity and morale significantly increased. Toyota became one of the world's largest automobile uh, companies, and many other manufacturers scrapped assembly line production for lean manufacturing. Car makers used to compete, now they cooperate. Now, there's much to be gained if we allow policy analysis and the design of them to follow suit. Too often, there's a tendency for fragmented incrementalism. Fragmented and incremental policy solutions are far less effective than comprehensive reforms which have the transformative power to break the cycle of poverty. So as you step into your next role, use your uniqueness to help shift the policy paradigm from a singular approach to bring integrated policy solutions that reflect the synergistic effects of education, safety net, health, and housing policies. You could be the generation that addresses racial, economic, and environmental justice issues with collaborative policies that forever change the course of history. The world needs you now. It's yearning, starving for you, your policy analysis, your leadership, your diverse perspectives, social justice, your understanding of the issues, the trade-offs, the alternatives, your appreciation for the power of policy to transform lives and the world around us. I pray that empowered with this degree in public policy, that you would discover a career path that overflows with immense possibility, improbable beauty, and relentless truth. There's a lot of delayed gratification in this work. So savor this moment of accomplishment, and then fly out of this building armed with the skills, tools, and knowledge that you make a difference, and that your policy analysis is necessary, your leadership is necessary, and the world and its constellations of problems are eagerly awaiting to hear what you have to say and do. So be sure to represent voices of those unheard and not at the policymaking table. Never grow, stop growing, never stop learning. Take off. Live without pretending. Love without depending. Listen without defending. Speak without offending. 
We look forward to reading all about your great exploits, following your paper trail, and to taking credit for all of them, <laughs> as if everything started here at GSPP. Thanks for the bright forecast ahead and allowing me to be your meteorologist for this special day. And it's my distinct. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's my distinct pleasure to bring up one of those graduates, Andrew Wilson, who will give the presentation of the GSPP class gift. Thank you, Andrew. Andrew, congratulations. It is not easy to follow Rucker Johnson. I would wish this on no one. Uh, but fortunately, well, I didn't bring any props either. Uh, but fortunately, my task is very simple. So I'm here representing the graduating MPP class. Um, and I've been tasked with presenting our gift to the school, which is a tradition of each graduating class, going back quite a ways. First, my thanks to Kenny and Dia for leading the class gift for effort with me. Thank you, too. I don't know where you are. So like any good aspiring policy analyst might do, we chose our class gift by constructing alternatives and implementing a convoluted multi-stage ranked choice to vote. Um, <laughs> but our choices were pretty constrained. Uh, the green couches in the living room, as you all know, went out to pasture last year. Um, the outside benches had been recently replaced by, I heard, a renegade professor with a skill saw on a weekend. <laughs> Tenure does amazing things. Um, and GSPP now even has a water bottle filling station thanks to the work of Whitney and some other students. Now. For the families here, that's actually a very big deal in Berkeley. Um, so in the end, uh, students voted to do two things. The first was to replace the entrance sign to GSPP uh, at the staircase off Leroy, which uh, uh, you need some background information, has disappeared a few times over the last couple of years in, in very Berkeley fashion. Um, I'm imagining someone with a living room with two GSPP signs in it. It's a bit disconcerting. But uh, the new sign will be installed soon uh, and will, I hope, be sturdy enough to withstand the test of time uh, and direct a few people who seem to be wandering around GSPP trying to find it um, into where they're supposed to be. In addition, and I think more importantly, uh, we raised far beyond the estimated cost of a sign, um, and we have chosen collectively to direct the remainder, uh, about $3,000, to uh, student scholarships that enhance the diversity of the students and the work done at GSPP. Um, so ultimately, GSPP, like society itself, is stronger when it's more diverse, and our class unanimously supported this purpose for the balance of our gift. I have five minutes, so I'm going to meander a little bit. Uh, I just want to give some closing remarks. Um, I recently saw a picture of uh, the entrance to the rector's palace in Dubrovnik. And over it, there's an inscription that reads, I don't speak Latin, but I'll try, uh, Oblidi Privatorum Publica Curate, which I'm told translates roughly to forget private matters, tend to public concerns. It's part advice and part admonishment that's intended to remind public servants, and really all of us, to shirk the narrow-mindedness that comes with financial private concerns and keep our hearts and minds focused on the public good. It's a spirit I've seen in everyone here today, uh, all of these wonderful friends I've developed over the past few years and longer. Um, and so as idealists who believe deeply in publicness and speaking truth to power, there's little we'd rather support with our very lean graduate student instructor salaries and APA stipends, uh, it seems, than this school, the best public policy school at the best public university in the world. Uh, so it's with profound gratitude that we give this gift to GSPP. Thank you for two fantastic years.
And that's it. It's now my pleasure to welcome MPA graduate Tato Mamabi, who will be presenting the MPA class gift to the school. Good morning, everybody. All right. Um, it gives me great pleasure to stand here. This is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. I'm excited to stand here on the shoulders of the great she giants. Because of them, we carry on. Our cohort is incredibly generous, smart, social justice-minded, and very fun, right? <laughs> and we are always looking out for the public good. So we decided after endless conversations over WhatsApp and um, taking doodle polls and doing all these different things that we are going to fundraise for the Capstone Award. We felt that a Capstone Award encapsulates our rich, fulfilling experience here at GSPP. And we wanted to show our gratitude towards the school, and we are so excited that we have started a brand new and important fund that we know will continue to grow, right? <laughs> All right. So drum roll for the news. Drum roll. OK. We successfully reached our goal of raising $2,500 towards the MPA capstone. Woo! <laughs> but, but that's not even the most amazing part. The most amazing part is we are the first class to reach 100% participation. <laughs> oh no, turn to your neighbor and say, they got 100% participation. Come on, turn to your neighbor. <laughs> All right, so we are very fortunate that we had the support from our family and friends and faculty and administrators, and we know that without them, we wouldn't be here. So GSPP, we want that Capstone Award to continue, and we will continue to support as alumni. Now, it is my pleasure to welcome Professor Sarah Anzia, who will present the Outstanding Graduate Instructor Award. <laughs> Hi, everybody. So it's my pleasure to present the award for Outstanding Graduate Student Instructor, or as we call them, GSI. Each year at commencement, we present this award to a graduate who has worked as a GSI for a GSPP course. This year, the Outstanding GSI Award goes to Danny Friel. Danny, can you come to the stage? I'm going to make you stand here for a little while, okay? Okay. Danny was a GSI for my politics class this past fall. This is a class about blending good policy with good politics. I have a few minutes, so. Uh, <laughs> no. As we all know, and is especially clear now, um, making public policy isn't just about finding or designing some best policy. Almost always, achieving the outcomes you think are best, um, or at least better, requires collective action, social engagement, understanding what elected officials are thinking about, what they value. Um, it involves negotiation and finding ways to build coalitions. So you need a political strategy, and that's what this class is about. Instead of a final paper or exam, we have a budget simulation, which was first created by John Elwood. 
each student is assigned a role. So most students are U.S. senators, uh, but there are also members of the administration, the media, the Congressional Budget Office. And over the course of about three weeks, um, the, it culminating in a final session, the student's goal is to hammer out and adopt a budget resolution. Um, by the way, I'm not very good at names, which is why I work so hard to remember everybody's names. But don't be offended if in the future, when I see you, I say, Mitch McConnell or, or Joni Ernst. Um, don't be offended. That's actually very common. So now Danny was a GSI for this course the past fall. And I want to explain that um, our MPP and MPA and PhD students are so amazing. And most, if not all of them, who do work as GSIs do an amazing job. Um, but it also came as no surprise to me that Danny was selected for this award. He was truly outstanding as a GSI for this course. This course is a lot of work. Um, Danny taught weekly sections. He helped me prepare and oversee the budget simulation. He graded three policy memos and an exam. And he got all of this done and did the highest quality work. I know that he gave detailed comments on all of the policy memos and really helped the students improve their writing. But there are a couple aspects of Danny's GSI work in particular that really stood out to me um, and stood out in my mind. The first was his creativity in, that he brought to planning and teaching sections, because I basically leave it up to the GSIs to come up with their own plans. Um, Danny designed and executed this part of the course on his own, and the material he came up with was fantastic. The second aspect that really stood out in my mind was that Danny was incredibly thoughtful and professional in working with me to manage the class as a whole. Throughout the semester, I really depended on the GSIs for advice on how to deal with certain situations that came up. And this fall, we did have a few situations. First, um, first of all, I think it's worth pointing out that our class started in the end of August 2016. Uh, there was a campaign going on. Uh, for the first two-thirds of the class. And even for political scientists, this was really hard to make sense of at many points. Um, and I regularly consulted with the GSIs on how to talk about the campaign in class, how to bring it up, how, what to discuss. And Danny always had excellent feedback. He was very much in touch with the students and what they were wondering, what they were asking about, what they were thinking. And then, on November 8th, um, we were about halfway into this three-week budget simulation. And I suspect that most GSP, uh, of the GSPP community was expecting Hillary Clinton to win. And then Donald Trump won. And I suppose I won't really shock anyone to say, by saying that many GSPP students were distressed by this outcome. And there was a small group of students in my class that felt strongly that because of the election outcome, um, they wanted to abandon the budget simulation and instead use the remaining time to pursue real political action. In other words, they, they thought, very reasonably so, that why should we put our time and energy into this fake simulation where we're pretending to be senators when we could instead use that time and energy to be politically active in a real way? Now, when they proposed this, this was a really difficult moment for me because I was trying to lead 80 students to the, in the best direction possible, and it is a class about politics. I had my thoughts on how to proceed, but as usual, I consulted with uh, my wonderful GSIs, and I'll never forget Danny's advice. Um, he responded very quickly in an email that evening, and I swear, this email wasn't very long, but he gave the most thoughtful, yet realistic, and comprehensive assessment of the situation, and I swear to you, he considered alternatives and trade-offs and made a recommendation. And I made my decision and felt good about it right then and there. And two of Danny's points were particularly persuasive to me. First, he said, um, this is just practical, the time that we would need to finish the budget simulation, about a week and a half, wouldn't be nearly enough time to craft and put into effect a good plan for grassroots organizing and resistance. And the second is that he, um, he said that he felt strongly that there are incredibly important lessons in the budget simulation project about constituencies, about coalition building, and about politics. And if the election outcome has motivated and inspired people, the students, to be more active in pol the political process, that's fantastic. And the lessons from the budget simulation will help them be effective. So we went ahead with the budget simulation. And I know not everyone in the class was happy with this, but that's also politics. But I do think. <laughs> I do think that most students saw great value uh, in the project. So to put it simply, Daniel was critical to making this class successful. He's creative, he's hardworking, he's very well organized, and he's a great person. So Danny, I'm very pleased to present you with the 2017 Outstanding GSI Award.
Hello, everybody. My name is Hector Cardenas, and I'm a GSPP, MPP, and PhD alum. And I have had the distinct pleasure and privilege to lead one of the advanced policy analysis classes this semester. As you all know, a fundamental part of the Goldman School of Public Policy's mission is to train a cadre of young professionals, that's you, yes, even the MPPs are young still, sort of, <laughs> for, uh, in the methods, techniques, and ethical underpinnings of public policy analysis. Ours is a discipline that strives above all else to better the world by providing practical solutions to the problems that we face in the public square. So to be complete, the education in which you have participated requires a capstone, a policy analysis for a real client facing a real problem or opportunity. The advanced policy analysis, or APA, also known, I think maybe in my class particularly as uh, appallingly painful afternoons, <laughs> is precisely such a capstone that allows our students to deploy the many resources that they have learned and acquired during their, 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 their time at GSPP uh, to the analysis of a real problem. The identification through evidence of possible alternatives to, for a solution and the crafting of feasible and implementable recommendations that their client can act upon. The school established the Smolensky Award in 1998, named to honor our Dean Emeritus, Gino Smolensky, and it's a prize to recognize the best advanced policy analysis in each graduating class. Faculty from each APA section nominate one APA project from their section to be considered for this honor. Then a committee of faculty who are not teaching APA review all nominated projects and select a winner. The faculty nominated the following graduates for consideration for the Smolensky Prize in alphabetical order. And please stand as your name is called. Daniel Blostein Reto. <laughs> Lillian Chen. <laughs> Megan Landing. <laughs> Melody Ng. Daniel Willis. Andrew Wilson. Eric Wilson. Wasn't there a band with all Wilsons? No, I think so. Rachel Young. The graduate selected as winner of the Spolensky Prize for Outstanding Advanced Policy Analysis is Daniel Blostein Reto. Please come up. Thank you. <laughs> Daniel. Daniel worked for the Environmental Defense Fund and wrote an APA entitled Assessing California's Policy Options to Reduce Greenhouse Gas Emissions Through Agricultural Soil Management. I did suggest a shorter title, but... <laughs> Dan's paper deals with an important environmental issue for California that has ramifications for other jurisdictions, both in the U.S. and internationally. His is an outstanding example of policy analysis the way it should be done. Dan first looks at the composition of greenhouse gas contributors and identifies soil management as a major source, albeit not the primary one, and estimates the effect of achieving major reductions in this area on overall GHG emissions. He concludes that there is low-hanging fruit and that abatement could be cost-effective. Dan defines a very clear problem that is backed up by facts and evidence and very effectively communicates the stakes involved, the opportunities for improvement, and the rationale 
from an economic efficiency point of view for government intervention. From his extensive literature review, he identifies the main alternatives for public policy intervention and explains each one of these extremely technical options in terms that are easily understandable to a lay reader. Perhaps the aspects that best represent the values and aspirations of our profession, policy analysis, lie in that Dan has laid out in a very clear and thoughtful manner the evaluative criteria that the outcomes of the analyzed alternatives should meet, and has then proceeded to project these outcomes meticulously by building a dynamic, scenario-based spreadsheet model to simulate them. Dan then confronts the trade-offs in a deliberate, nuanced, and thoughtful way, and makes very specific and well-fleshed-out recommendations. Dan has done what we teach and expect of a sophisticated policy analyst, to look at the world, frame a problem, gather facts, leverage existing research, then assemble data and use all of this to construct simple yet powerful models to understand the likely effects of policy interventions, then confront trade-offs and make well-reasoned and responsible, responsible recommendations. The work that Dan has done represents the very best policy analysis strives for and a source of hope that even in these pitiful days, I was going to say sad, truth may yet speak to power and prevail. Congratulations, Dan, on a very successful culmination of your time at GSPP. I also had the privilege of teaching two sections in the brand new capstone analytic project of the MPAs that has just been funded, which is wonderful, and we have an, a, an award for that as well. And so it's my honor to present the first ever Bardak Prize for Outstanding Capstone Analytic Project. This award, named after our own after our, our and my dear friend, colleague, and mentor, Eugene Bardak, sitting right there. <laughs> the, the father of the Eightfold Path. Yes, all of you have him to blame for that. <laughs> Recognizes the best capstone analytic project written by a graduate of GSBC's newest program, the Master in Public Affairs. Like the APA, the CAP is the culmination of our students' work at GSPP and affords them the opportunity to work with a real client on a real problem and deploy all the tools they have acquired during their breakneck education at, at the school. Faculty from each uh, CAP section nominate one project from their section to be considered for the honor. And this year, it was Gene Bardak himself who reviewed all nominated projects and selected a winner. The faculty nominated the following graduates for consideration for the Bardak Prize. And again, in alphabetical order, and please stand when you're called. Todd Achilles. <laughs> Daniel Bradway. <laughs> and Elizabeth O'Malley. And the graduate selected as winner of the Bardak Prize for Outstanding Capstone Analytic Project is Todd Achilles. Congratulations. Thanks. Todd's paper, Solving California's Broadband Divide, written for the Green Lining Institute, is an examination of the problem of the regional and social differences in access to fixed broadband internet services in California. The paper addresses an important problem that affects a substantial proportion of the state's most vulnerable population. Yet Todd does not simply assume that this is a problem that requires government action. He methodically builds the case 
based on standard economic theory and then demonstrates that monopoly rent, that monopoly pricing is happening and estimates the size and impact of monopoly rents extracted from consumers. He does this in an ingenious way by determining marginal pricing based on a global comparison of commercial broadband rates and then calculates the price elasticity of demand to complement his analysis and estimate the overall consumer surplus loss due to monopoly pricing behavior. Now, for those of you who are not economists, this is a big deal. <laughs> and perhaps more importantly, it bears bad news for all of us. We are all paying way too much for our internet. <laughs> Todd's approach is meticulous and clear-headed. He very quickly and clearly defines the social objectives that a successful approach to this problem requires and lays out well-specified criteria. Then he presents a policy recommendation section that is coherent, strategic, and includes a clear vision, a political strategy to make the vision feasible, and specific recommendations using both traditional and innovative approaches. Needless to say, his plan does not fit onto a single page of bullet points. Todd's work is a shining example of the kind of policy analysis that we train our students to do at GSPP and of the kind of deliberate analytical approach that has served this state and country well whenever it has been applied. Congratulations, Todd, for an excellent conclusion to your MPA degree. Great. My name is Martha Chavez, Dean of Students, and it is my privilege <laughs> It is my privilege to begin the presentation of the Master of Public Policy degrees. Okay. Max Aronson. Sarah Alexis Levine Abarbanel. Yeah. Velour Adithi. Yeah. Mina Iyer. Yeah. Saida Zara Ali. Christian Arana. Elsa Augustine. Sahalit Bahiru. Monica Laura Balanoff. Cassandra Marie Bayer. Jillian Isabel Birkin. Daniel Blaustein Reto. Magali Chavez. Lillian Chen. Kirsten Chase Cook. Paloma Corcuera. Caitlin Casati. Niat Daniel. Gita Divani. Paul Diaz Trios. 
Sabhanaz Rashid Dia. Michael Drain. Hulan Erdenebatar. Daniel Friel. Marta Ann Galan. Madeline Rose Jelpi. Ben Gould. Sarah Amanda Green. Sabrina Ham. Andrew Herman. Charlotte Hill. Kenneth Hoffmeister. Jennifer Lynn Hogue. Ruben Daniel Holliber. Kevin Alexander Howard. Alice Herr. Karen Wynn. Mark Jimenez. Benjamin Kennigsberg. Woody Consummate. Nisha Karani. Elizabeth Lai. Megan Landine. Noah Lehman. Janice Levy. Jeremy Levy. Sarah Litke. Lindsay Maple. <laughs> Carolina Maslanka. <laughs> Ryan Melendez. <laughs> Robert Flanagan Moore. <laughs> Taylor Moore Myers. Melody Ng. Min Nguyen. Bi Chin Un. Jonathan Parker. Marco Petsock. Philip Pena. Yeah. Congratulations. Nice Zohar Perla. Yeah. Congratulations. Ian Perry. Yeah. Congratulations. Tarunima Propagar. Yeah. Juan Manuel Ramirez. Whitney Ramos. Whitney. Okay. Abigail Ridley Kerr. Hortensia Rodriguez Sandoval. 
Gregory Makafa Ribka. Laura Sanchez Bolaños. Ryan Garcia Sapinoso. Alexandria Shen. Allison Joanne Silvera. Jason Sue. Alyssa Julia Skog. Nancy Gail Stetson. Satoshi Suzuki. Jason Tillipman. Sarah Walker Ting. Matthew Valletta. Brett Webster. Keith Welch. Daniel Willis. Andrew Wilson. Eric Wilson. Rachel Young. Stacy Zong. And now I will turn it over to Professor Jane Malden, who will present the Master of Public Affairs degrees. Todd Baker Achilles. Raul Ernesto Aguilar. Mark Edward Bellis. Jasmeet Bindra. Daniel Bradway. Chloe Brown. Krista Brown. Felipe Carrera Gallo. Jeremy Chun. Elizabeth Ann Gress. Scott D. Cole. Frank Molina. De and Ni. Elizabeth Francis O'Malley. Rada Ulamin. Erica Christine Paul. Velrazu Periyasami. Tato Ramoabi. <laughs> Jeffrey Rios. Julian Rue. Sabit Sandibayev. Lido Schlesinger. Godwin Tang. Ravikant Tatipudi. Mariana Vialvazo Martin.
There's an important piece of paper here which has what I have to say to make the degrees official. You may have noticed we had a little problem over there. I want to thank the faculty. <laughs> it takes a faculty to get the diplomas out. I apparently was a little bit too energetic there for a moment. Um, so it's been great having you with us here, the MPPs and the MPAs. It's especially exciting to have our first MPA class. Um, yes, yes. I really feel like we've enlarged and improved GSPP by having both the MPP and the MPA. And thank you for all being here, being part of our community. And I look for such great things of all of you. And I really must say, it's one of the, the great thrills is watching what you do. And you heard Rucker, Rucker told you, you've got to be very bright and shiny and you've got to do great stuff so that Rucker can wear his sunglasses. <laughs> <laughs> Which unfortunately, I, I couldn't see it. I want you to put them on when I can see it. Um, okay, so now I get to say this. First you have to stand, please. By virtue of the authority vested in me by the President and the Regents of the University of California, I grant you this degree from the Goldman School of Public Policy. Congratulations! So this concludes, this concludes the class of 2017 commencement. Guests are invited to join us for a reception at 2607 Hearst. That's just down the street this way, about uh, three or four blocks. Uh, so there'll be a parade, I'm sure, going down there. Please join us. Congratulations. Congratulations.